skeptical agnostic's video response, two brains good, one brain better, a response, he bifurcates his video into two main sections. Section A details his arguments against dualism, while section B focuses more on his arguments, uh, focuses more on the arguments that I raised against naturalism and the mind in my video series on dualism. Now before I go on, I'd like to thank Alex for his well thought out video response, and also mention that the title of this video is not meant to be condescending, but more it's an option to put a pun in, and so I went for it. I love puns. Now since I'd like to keep this discussion as organized and concise as possible, I'm going to attempt to focus the majority of my response on Alex's arguments against dualism. We'll see how well I do. So I'm going to briefly move through his response and then detail um, his objections a little more at length. Now before I do this, it would be good to note that in my series Dualism Revamped, I leveled three major arguments against naturalism's account for the mind-brain relation. Those being one, the indiscernibility of identicals, two, the persistent I, and three, libertarian free will. Now this takes us to Alex's second portion of his video, his original video, which I will discuss first, which details his responses to the arguments that I raised in my dualism series. Now vis-a-vis -vis these objections, Alex focuses exclusively on the persistent I argument and does not discuss the other two, which should be noted and kept in mind for those who follow this discussion. But I do understand due to time constraints that we can't talk about every single point in a seven-part series, so it doesn't matter that much to me. Now first, Alex states, while there are plenty of physicalists that Counts, I focus almost exclusively on eliminative materialism. Now, while I appreciate Alex's correct distinction here, I did mention in part 3 at approximately 5 minutes 45 seconds that I was aware of this. But I did not think said idea was too detrimental since there are the three arguments that I did level against naturalism pertain to all sorts of physicalism, and additionally I listed several problems that I had with each of the additional uh, forms of physicalism in the description. So that it was addressed. Second, versus the argument from the persistent I that I leveled against naturalism and for dualism, Alex raises Hume's theory on substance, namely bundle theory, as an alternative to Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas' standard theory on substance. Given this alternative theory of substance is correct, if we assume that, Alex argues we can argue that the succession of cells via indirect continuity answers my objection. Now hopefully without getting too far afield, I'd like to make two quick points, if I may. First, we would need arguments to accept Hume's bundle theory over the traditional theory of substance via Aristotle and Aquinas, and without arguments for this, we would be begging the question that bundle theory is more persuasive. Second, when discussing the alleged lacking ontology of God, Alex states that listing off properties does not equate to a positive ontology. But this raises the question in my mind as to why he then uses Hume's bundle theory against the persistent I argument that I raised. Accordingly, in regards to substance and ontology, wherein a substance is exhaustively defined by its properties, then bundle theory is not a positive ontology via this argument. We can't have this both ways, so I'm, I don't know where he wants to go with that. Third, there are at least two large problems with bundle theory as it pertains to substance and ontology that tend to convince me, at least, that it is not a persuasive theory. Namely, one, bundle theory cannot account for the contingency of substances, and two, bundle theory cannot maintain that substances are literally the same thing through change. Please look at the description for details of these objections. Third, Alex states that while I quoted Searle, and he helped me with that pronunciation, thank you, I did not discuss his theory of biological naturalism, wherein the interaction between the mind and the brain is contingent in its correlations. This also could be an adequate alternative to substance dualism, Alex argues, and accordingly Occam's razor applies. However, we cannot just say that this could be an adequate alternative. We would need arguments, otherwise we're just begging the question. So if we want to talk about Cyril's um, hypothesis here, we can, but I think that would take us far afield. Moreover, there are objections that I can think of to level against this theory. Namely, one, the position is not a naturalistic one. If anything, it's epiphenomenal. Two, correlations are not explanations. And three, McGinn's objection on causal necessitation applies. So the point again is that one would need to develop this theory better before stating that it has won the day. All this brings us to the second portion of Alex's video, which is actually the initial portion of his initial video, where he levels several arguments against substance dualism. Now, I detected four counterarguments: One, private versus public language. Two, Occam's razor. Three, the incoherence of substance dualism. And four, a lacking of a positive ontology for the mind. 
First, in regards to the objection from language, it would seem to me dubious to argue that language depends on the public world. Language is a set of diacritics, whether, diacritics, whether that's written or verbalized, that depends on actual states of affairs in which they represent, much like a sentence represents the proposition. Thus, while language seems to function publicly, I would not go so far as to say that it depends on the public world as it represents real states of affairs that could very well be private. Moreover, I am often rather leery of arguments that depend on linguistic nuances and find them odd. Now, that's not an argument, that's just a personal preference. Second, in regards to the objection from Occam's Razor, I have answered this both in this video and in the series that he was responding to, so I'm not going to repeat myself a third time here. Third, in regards to the objection from incoherency, I infer from his video to be to do that Alex views substance dualism as a category error. However, if the mind is nothing more than a concept which we discover via its behavioral manifestations, as Alex holds to, then this does nothing to answer the utter uniqueness of the mind via the indiscernibility of identicals argument that has yet to be addressed. Moreover, I don't think the argument from analogy works in reference to the mind as a concept, because it, a concept in of itself is a mental entity, if by concept we mean a directly conceived or initiated object of thought. So I don't think these objections are very convincing at least to me. This brings us to Alex's fourth argument, which I think is his best argument, detailing the positive ontology of the mind. Therein it has asked just what is the mind? What does it consist of? How do we know computers are not minded but humans are, etc. So in other words, Alex does not think that there is a positive ontology being made for substance dualism. I'd like to spend the remainder of this video attempting to clarify as best I can the ontology of substance dualism, so here goes. First, given the problems with Hume's bundle theory regarding substance and ontology, the traditional view following Aristotle and Aquinas details seven characteristics that will be true for any given substance. It would seem to me that minds meet these seven characteristics rather easily, as further detailed in the description. Second, from what I have read on the subject, the soul has a somewhat intricate nature and internal structure. As I detail in the description, the characteristics of a substance as outlined by Aristotle and Aquinas present the soul as a unified reality that informs the body while occupying the body while not being extended in the body. In other words, by occupy, I mean that the soul has direct and immediate conscious awareness of each and every part of the body and can directly and immediately will to move the various parts of the body or what have you. Thus, there is no intervening mechanism that relates the two substances together as the correlations are immediate and direct. Now, in order to understand the internal structure of the soul or the mind, we need to grasp two important issues, the different types of states within the body, or within the soul, excuse me, and the notion of a faculty of the soul. The soul contains numerous mental states within it, like sensations, beliefs, desires, acts of will, thoughts, etc., and has numerous potential and actual faculties for the ability to see, the ability to think, change thoughts, etc. Third, I think when this question is asked, the questioner is really asking what the substance of the mind is made of, which makes sense. Given Aristotle and Aquinas' development of substance, the majority of substances that exist contain two things, form, which contains the accidental and uh, essential properties of that thing, and the material it's made of. However, there are several exceptions regarding the contents of substance, namely God, and a few other things that were considered pure form by Aristotle. Thus, the best I can do when someone asks what the soul is made of is simply to point to this distinction as made by Aristotle. The mind does not contain matter or anything derivative of it, like energy. Otherwise, the mind would not be immaterial, right? It is simply pure form. It could be objected that this renders the soul untestable via the naturalistic scientific method, as the entity in question is not directly accessible. However, I don't think that this is a very good objection because there are other numerous entities that science postulates that while it can't directly observe, are believed to exist because of the, the observable effects that science is aware of. For example, black holes are not directly observable, yet the effects of light bending tends to lead scientists to postulate them, and I don't see that why there's any reason to treat the mind any differently. I hope this is a good adequate response and it's a good clarification on the topic. Peace, thanks for your video response.